I'm really excited tonight because we have two very special people with us, and I'd like to read their bios to you. Uh, to my far right, we have uh, Craig Malloy. In 2003, Craig had a vision to change the way the world communicates, and his answer to the re-imaging of the video communication business. To this day, his quest remains unchanged. Craig started Life Size in 2003, oversaw its acquisition by Logitech in 2009, and served as CEO until 2012. But drawn back by his unceasing passion for the industry and reinventing video technology, he returned to Life Size again in 2014. Craig's video uh, communications experience dates back to 1994 when he worked at VTEL Corporation in Austin, prior to find, founding Life Size in September of 1996. He launched Via Video, an Austin-based startup for which he served as a co-founder and the CEO. Via Video was purchased by Polycom in 1998, which launched their video communications business. Craig was general manager of Polycom's video communications division for more than four years leading up to his establishing of life size. With a background in the US Navy, which we'll pursue a little bit tonight, Craig brings two key tenants with him to his leadership role at life size. First, taking care of your people, or life sizes, as they like to say, and creating an environment where they can maximize their creativity and achieve their professional goals. The success of this philosophy is evident as Craig has celebrated 10-year work anniversaries with a number of colleagues, each of whom has stood by his side and watched a startup grow to become an industry leader. And we're so glad to have you here tonight, Thank Craig. You. And uh, to my immediate right is Milam Newby. Milam is the managing partner of Vincent and Elkins Austin office. Milan's practice focuses on private and public companies from startups to Fortune 500 companies, venture capital firms, and other private and public equity investors. Milan assists companies and investors in private financing transactions, private and public securities offerings, merger and acquisition, management buyouts, and other business matters. Milan is a graduate of the University of Texas at Austin with a BA in government in 2000 and a JD in 2003, and serves on several not-for-profit boards here in the Austin community. We're happy to have you both tonight. Thank, Thank you for to, having us. To explore um, your backgrounds and uh, somewhat about the life size acquisition. Craig, may we start with you? Can sure. you tell us about your entrepreneurial uh, endeavors and the background you have chosen to take over the years? Yeah, I, I, always, wanted to, uh, I always wanted to be uh, an entrepreneur. I always wanted to envision myself running a company um, even so, I, I ended up at the, the Naval Academy for college, which is not the, you know, the most natural career path for that. Um, as my uh, Navy time was coming to an, an end, uh, oh, back up just a, a minute. My, my father had, uh, um, was, a, was an entrepreneur of sorts. He uh, ran a small manufacturing company in Orange County, California, where I grew up. And I was always fascinated at the uh, at the, uh, the little factory in the, in the, in the, in the warehouse where we, we ran making gears for the aerospace industry. And I'd love to go hang out there and, and watch it run the business and watch raw material coming in the front and, uh, and finished products going out the door and, and uh, you know, watching him interact with, his, uh, interact with his, the people that work for him and, and, the, and how much they, they worked hard for him and the leadership style and how, and how how uh, carefully he tended the business and how much he took care of the people. And I always admired that about my, about my, uh, about my dad. And so I always had this kind of desire to uh, be my own boss, run a, run a business, but didn't quite know how to get there um, or even what that l looked like. And so my time at the, uh, the, the Naval Academy and, and as a Navy officer was, you know, was really instrumental in, uh, in my development as a, as a leader and a, and a, a a, 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 not really a business person, but, but certainly the form my, um, you know, the backbone of my, my leadership capabilities. Um, I worked for a, a number of years after that in, um, you know, in a couple of corporate jobs, and then made my, made my way to, uh, to Austin in 1994 um, with a, a, an early pioneer in the video communication business called VTEL, VTEL here. Worked there for a couple of years, and had an idea with a couple of other guys who worked in the, worked in the company. It's like, well, we can do this. We could do this better. There's a new, a new, uh, a new wave of technology coming, and um, we left, struck out on our own, and formed a company. And 
and started looking to, uh, to raise, uh, raise some venture capital money. Had no idea how to do that. Absolutely zero <laughs> idea how to raise venture capital money. And this was 1996, kind of the internet bubble was getting into, uh, into full swing. So I just started cold calling venture capitalists and realized now that really wasn't the right way to go, to go about it. But, uh, but it, uh, it actually worked. <laughs> I found, uh, I just happened to cold call a, a, a venture capitalist that had funded a, a previous company in the video communication business and kind of got that, got that, got that started. Um, you know, and I, the, uh, and we ran that, uh, ran that the program with, with uh, uh, via video, and we were, you know, it had happened very quickly that we were purchased by, by Polycom and then kind of uh, learned a lot in my time at, uh, in my, my four years of time at Polycom. Uh, and I, then I realized I, I really wasn't that great an employee. Um, I, I just I, feel, I felt like I was much better as a um, as a CEO of a smaller smaller organization. Um, and, I, and, I, and frankly, I think maybe that's uh, although I was a uh, I like I think I was a really good Navy officer. Um, it, it, w it wasn't what I wanted to it wasn't what I wanted to do for a, for a career. I, I found myself being drawn to smaller smaller organizations. And so, once again, I, I, I left and, and started uh, again, I'm a next generation product in the video communication business called uh, Life, Size, Life Size Communication. We were focused on high definition video communication over IP networks. That sounds really boring today because you can do that on your phone. Um, but in uh, 2003, that was pretty, that was pretty cool. Uh, and I uh, was fortunate enough to be able to, to run that um, and grew, grew very quickly, purchased uh, Purchased by Logitech, the, the mice and keyboard company, in 2009, um, and I stayed for two years to uh, to see through the, the transition of the company. And once again, I found myself not not being a very good employee. Didn't that's not really what I wanted to do for a larger for a larger larger organization. Um, and I needed to scratch my entrepreneurial itch again, so I left Logitech and started a small software company here in in town. Um, Two years later, Logitech came uh, came knocking uh, again. Said, "Hey, uh, Craig, the uh, you know the, our business is struggling a little bit. There's a huge technology transition going on, uh, and would you come back and uh, come back and help? And there's a you know possibility um, maybe to uh, maybe to be independent again down the down the road. Um, and so I went went back to went back to life size. And, and interestingly enough, when we're going through this." Significant business transformation from a hardware-based, uh, hardware-based company with lots of on-premise infrastructure to something a company that now lives in the cloud and, and on mobile mobile devices, and so it almost feels like a new company, a new startup, and it's new markets, new distribution channels, new technology, a lot of the same folks, a lot of the same team, which is fun, but uh, we're now we're going through this fundamental transformation of the company from a a hardware-based company to a, a, a cloud service company, which is really challenging and really and really interesting, and, and uh, you know, very interesting from a, you know from a strategy standpoint, and um, and feels like a feels like a brand new a brand new company. So I've been been really blessed, you know, in my career over the past 20 years to uh, be the founder of three companies and have had the opportunity to sell to sell two of them, and now kind of go back and transform one of the ones that. Uh, that uh, that I started uh, bef before, you know, the, and one of the reasons that people ask me why I went back, and one of the reasons was, and I think all good entrepreneurs would would say this, is uh, as much as you try not to get emotionally attached to your business, I think all good entrepreneurs do get emotionally attached to their business, and sometimes it's not healthy, but I think that's what makes that's what makes you know what makes it uh, what makes it good, you know, you always, always hear people say, well, there's you know, don't miss business and personal. But for entrepreneurs who are starting starting a business and growing, and it is almost like, almost like a part of your family. And um, you know, one of the reasons I went back is our life size was struggling a little bit. And I will say, well, it's like if you're one of your adult children got into trouble. Of course, you would go back and, and help. I knew exactly what to go do. I you know my the team was still there, um, and it's been uh, it's been a great experience to to go to go back in and help and help transform it into a new uh, in, in a new way. So, 20 years after I'm celebrating my 20-year anniversary here in uh, um, in uh, in Austin last month, have been uh, in 18 years of uh, 
of being an entrepreneur in Austin, and this is a, such a, a vibrant, wonderful community for, uh, you know, for, for uh, uh, starting businesses and, uh, and the support structure that you need here uh, from, you know, legal and educational <coughs> institutions like UT, and it's just been a uh, fabulous journey over the past 20 years here in Austin. Great, thank you. Just, just a little piece, a little quick question. Mm -hmm. How much did you sell life size for? Uh, Four hundred and five million dollars. Not bad. It was, it was very nice. Yes. Can I have a few little companies like that? I, I, <laughs> I, that I only had a small piece of it at that point. But, it was, it, I just but it's still, yes. still good. Yes. Quite an achievement. Thank, Thank you. you. Milam, tell us about um, Vincent and Elkins and the role that specifically uh, your firm played in, in, the in the acquisition process from Life Size to Logitech. Sure, so I mean, uh, Vincent Elkins is a global international law firm. We have offices all over the world, about 600 lawyers, um, at just some sort of data points. Uh, you know, we're headquarters out of Houston. We've got 300 or so in Houston, but office in Austin of about 55. Uh, we're very active um, and really known internationally in the energy space. Um, and you know, we, like other Texas-based firms, have really um, been able to capitalize on the energy boom over the last really decade, but particularly the last several years. Um, we in Austin try to stay uh, as far away from the energy space as we can. Um, and I, I say that sort of tongue in cheek, but what, what we love doing is working with um, early stage emerging companies. Um, you know, Austin is a very vibrant, small legal community. Um, you know, Michelle Early and our friends at Lock Order here, I mean, it's a great, it's, it's a great place to be a partner. I went to law school because um, I wanted to be a politician and I was convinced that I was going to be president of the United States and I was going to help people and solve all the world's problems. <laughs> and I um, went to law school and started clerking at the firm and actually realized that I really enjoyed practicing law. And the reason I enjoyed it was because the same reason I thought I would do politics was I liked helping people. Um, you know, in, as a lawyer, you sort of have this binary pact, like I'm either going to be a litigator, trial lawyer, or I'm going to be a corporate lawyer. And there's, obviously, it's not quite that black and white, but. Um, I thought I would be like a trial lawyer and I would be out there fighting for the little guy and um, you know it was just it was there's like it's a zero-sum game there are winners and losers and your goal is to either be on the winning side or the losing side and what I liked about transactional law was it's not it's not that black and white I mean there are I mean, there, there are points you win and lose but at the end of the day most of the time in a deal um, you know you have a buyer who wants to buy a company and you have a seller who wants to sell the company and you, you have a common goal and yes, there's, there's give and take and there are difficult times and there's the breakup moment where you think you're gonna never talk each, to each other again and the deal falls apart. And, um, but at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's a collaborative spirit. Um, you know, we've been very fortunate in Austin to represent a lot of great companies and a lot of great entrepreneurs, Life Size and Craig being, being one of them. You know, we sort of have a, I call it the Volk Rule, and it's named after the um, longtime head of our section, Bill Volk, who sort of created the corporate practice in Austin several years, you know, 20, 30 years ago. And it's a three-part test. I mean, when we're looking at do we represent a, an emerging company, it's, you know, do they have an established sort of business practice? Not, not established, or they, it doesn't have to be revenue generating, but, you know, do, do we as lawyers see sort of a path forward? Um, is there a path towards getting money? So, um, you know, do they either have venture capital lined up or are they in discussions with venture capital investors or other investors? Um, and third is, is, do they have an established management team? Are these people who know how to run companies? Craig is a great example of that. You know, started a company, sold it. Started Life Size, sold it. Back at Life Size, was it, you know, was it another software company? I mean, these are, these are people that we want to be partners with because they know how to buy and sell companies. Is every company successful? No. Um, Craig's had a very good track record. Not everybody has that track record, but we, we want to partner with people who um, know how to run companies and know how to be successful, and we've been um, very fortunate to partner not only with Craig and Life Size, but other companies in Austin that, that, um, that have had very good trajectories. That's great. Um, Let's not miss the fact that V&E is the number one kind of merger and acquisition firm, I think, in the last uh, year in the Texas market. Yeah, Texas, we've, um, we've, we've done very well in Texas. Um, I, I mentioned the, the oil and gas space. Um, uh, we've done, so I, I've, I've got a number that goes back to January of 2013. We're sitting at deal value of about $139 billion. Um, just in the M&A space, which is, uh, which is a, an obviously a big number. We actually claim $180 billion internally. 
um, as, as Michelle and our lawyers in the room could say, <clears throat> uh, law firm rankings are done. You get credit based on certain things. We, we think we should get more credit than we've been given, but. Um, you don't, anyone doesn't know a lawyer like that, do yeah. they? <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. <laughs> Um, but no, we've we've it's been a it's been a great it's been an incredible time to be a, a transaction lawyer in Texas. Um, we we um, we're, we're very fortunate to be where we are. That's great. That's great. Tell us a little bit between the two of you of if you don't mind share some of the story of uh, the Logitech acquisition and how that went about. And Craig, why did you come to V&E and what kind of expertise did you need at that time in a 400 million plus acquisition? Well, V&E had been our had been our corporate counsel for um, uh, you know for six years before the, the transaction. Bill Volk, who uh, Milam was just uh, re referring to, um, was our would come to all of our board meetings. We would uh, you know call him for every you know significant legal need we had. He was almost part of our almost part of our team. Bill's a fine lawyer, a fine man, a fine um, mentor in many ways for for um, you know how to think about your business and protect it um, from a legal, a legal standpoint. They didn't, they didn't handle all of our legal needs, but he could always direct us to where we needed to go, whether it was litigation or labor law or, or patents or, or anything that we needed to go. So Bill was already, Bill Volk at D&E was already, uh, you know, a, a counselor for our business along the way. So it was natural for, uh, for them to help us with um, with our, uh, you know, with our acquisition needs, and that is more than any time in your company's history, uh, you need a, uh, uh, you know, a top-tier law firm to help you with that. You, you know, everybody thinks, well, I just need a banker to sell my company. No, you need a lawyer to sell your company. I mean, bankers can be helpful, but, but. Um, you know, the, the term sheet that you get to with a banker is just the beginning of the beginning. <laughs> it, is the, it is the definitive agreement that, that, you're, that you craft with your lawyer and who represents you in the negotiations with the, with, with the buyer means everything. I mean, there is so much. The price is just, you know, that much. And the, the, the definitive agreement is, is, you know, is so much more. Uh, and, you know, it's just night and day of what what a good law firm who is thorough and understands all of the the nuances in the language that entrepreneurs and business people don't deal with. I had, um, you know, particularly at the a, a young technology company focused on technology and selling and customers. Um, that, that's not the language that I spoke every day. I had, you know, you start reading through these definitive agreements, it's just mind numbing. So. Uh, it was absolutely vital to have a firm like V&E by our side to help us through that. And uh, um, there was, you know, really trying times in that whole, uh, mom said, well, it's two companies that, two, two partners that want to consummate a deal. Well, maybe, <laughs> depends on, you know, and there's this wide chasm of, of the points in the yeah. definitive agreement that there's a huge contention around. Alan, talk, to, talk about some of the key areas in an acquisition document that an entrepreneur needs to be knowledgeable about or at least aware of. Yeah, I mean, I, I said that um, we have the common objective, which is getting a deal done, and, and that's, that's right. But, you know, as Craig mentions, that's, that's here and there's all this over here. I mean, you know, if you're a buyer, you want to pay the least amount of money you can. And if you're a seller, you want to get the most amount of money you can. Um, if you're... Um, you know, if you're a buyer, you want as many um, opportunities to walk away from the deal if you don't like it. And as a seller, you want to put ink to paper and know you have a deal signed. Um, if you're a buyer, you want to sign and close the deal, but know that if you discover something after the deal closes, you can go back and get some of your money back. And if you're a seller, you want to sell and walk away and take your $400 million and go do something else. Um, and so there's, you know, that, that, that basically sums up an entire sort of acquisition process and an agreement where there are a bunch of competing forces, but we're all, you know, we're all, we're all trying to get it done, but we're trying to get on terms, done the terms the most favorable to us. Um, you know, I think what I would tell entrepreneurs is, I, and you may have some perspective on this, I, I say run your company every day like you're going to sell. Um, and that, you know, that doesn't mean manipulate revenue. I mean, that, that doesn't mean necessarily from a revenue standpoint. But think about, I mean, the things you do on a day-to-day -day basis are gonna impact a sale transaction. 
um, or by transaction. Things like if you're an IP intensive company, is your IP protected? Are your employees signing you know, rights to the IP over? Um, because I promise you that a buyer who's buying you for your IP is going to literally uncover every stone and every crumb that there is in your company. Um, you know, about the same time we were doing life size, we sold another um, software company in Austin to IBM. Um, IBM's due diligence request for a company is literally 200 pages long. I mean, it is, it is the most comprehensive, extensive thing you'll ever see. And I think the, the more you can do on a day-to-day -day basis of preparing my company to be sold, the better off you'll be. Um, when, you're, when you're signing up commercial contracts with customers, <clears throat> things like, what happens if I sell my company? Do I need to go get consent from this customer to, assign, to, do, this, to do this deal? Um, they're, they're not things you really think about on a day-to-day -day basis. You're just worried about getting that customer signed up. But I think if you can, I think if you can think about your company every day as how is this going to look when a buyer comes in, I think you, you're in a much better position to be um, ha have a smooth acquisition process. Craig, did did you have any key points during the Logitech acquisition that came up that you that you thought how could the buyer want this? Um, yeah, they, I mean, Logitech has bought a lot of companies, and they're a big company with, um, you know, armies of lawyers that are as, as employees, and right. so they had uh, almost unlimited resources to ask, ask for things. Uh, Mylon's absolutely right, um, and if you, you, along the way, you need to make sure you have all, all those things in, in a row in terms of IP and employees and not, uh, you know, give a right of first refusal to a big customer, you know, to a big partner for a a deal or something like that. And so we were, in, we were in good shape from that standpoint. We really got stuck around um, the, uh, what they called reps and warranties. And when Milan was alluding to that of um, all these outs and a way to get your money back, typically there's an escrow, you know, maybe it's 10 to 15% of the size of the deal that's, that's held aside in case something bad comes up later, they can go get, they can get part of their money back. And the the ways and you know things that could happen to get your to, for them to get their money back are, you know, as as much as you could imagine and and is and, and negotiate. And there was the first some companies when they buy you they'll depending who's drafting drafting the documents will be very middle of the road and you know kind of fair to both sides. Our first um, our first draft from from Logitech was one of the was reps was you you uh, represent that you're software of which you know millions of lines of code six years worth of, of code development is free of any software bugs and if any customer reports a software bug that gives us the right to go take money out of the escrow account i mean it's just absurd it's, it's absurd on its face so that was that was our starting point and so you can see how contentious it was to start to be able to walk that to walk that back to something that we could we could we could live that and to live with that was just the the most extreme example of reps and warranties and, and why you need a, a good lawyer to help you know help you negotiate those those types of things. Did 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 your law firm become an extension of your company, like your legal division? Oh absolutely. I mean we spent you know hours, days in the in the V in the office going through these going through these negotiations and uh, um, just you know helping us through the process. It was just very very complex. Life size, the first time uh, when we sold the video to Polycom, much smaller transaction. Um, we, hadn't, we didn't even have a shipping product yet. Uh, we only 40 people in the company. Life size at $80 million, of, $80 million of revenue, 20, $100 million run rate, hundreds of employees, thousands of customers, entities all over the world for, for selling is much, much more complicated and complex. complex. Well, and I remember, I mean, at, at this time, Craig selling a company and, and having to spend hours and hours reviewing agreements and reps and warranties and spending time with Vini's office, he's also trying to concurrently run a company. Um, because until you close, there's no guarantees. And so while, while you're trying to sell your company on the one hand, you've got to continue, you know, meeting customer expectations, getting the product out the door, keeping your employees happy. I mean, it's... Um, I mean, not, not having been an entrepreneur, it seems to me that being in a sale process is one of the most challenging, difficult, and draining times, um, just because you're, you're, you're running and selling at the same time. In fact, that's a, very good, that's a very good point. It's a good thing that we closed that transaction, that transaction because that quarter, we were so distracted, we just absolutely tanked that quarter. 
as a, you know, in, in, terms of, in terms of revenue. It was, a huge it was a huge fall off. Now, we quickly rebounded, but it was so distracting and so stressful. In fact, uh, one, of my, uh, one of our um, reseller partners called me um, you know, right after the, uh, one of the companies that sells our, sells our product, this guy actually lives in, in the Netherlands, called me right after we, we sold the company. He said, well, I'm, I'm glad it was an acquisition because the last time I saw you, I thought you were sick. You were so <laughs> bad. <laughs> so it's like, no, I was just going through the acquisition. Yeah, process. Process. <laughs> two two full-time jobs yeah, at exactly. the same time. Very stressful. So, Craig, tell us the single largest surprise in the exit process of any of your companies you've had. And Milam, I'm going to ask you a similar question. Kay. The single largest surprise of any of the, the transactions you've dealt with that r really was astounding to you or unexpected. I wouldn't say there was anything that was a huge um, surprise. I guess my, the, the biggest surprise why was why Logitech, a company that made mice and keyboards primarily in the retail industry, would want to buy LifeSize, a company that made video communication products for businesses. It, when, they, when the banker for first called me and said, Logitech's interested in buying you, I almost laughed. I go, what? that doesn't make any sense. Why would they want to buy us? Um, but it, you know, when we dug into it, it was more, uh, they, they were in consumer and retail, that, that, the, the rise of, uh, of tablets, um, they wanted to diversify out of just consumer retail into, into B2B. Um, they had a long history in, in webcams, which they, they still do, so they had some, some knowledge in video, so video seemed to be a good entry into the, the world of, uh, of B2B. Uh, so that was probably the biggest the bigger surprise of uh, wh why they would be interested in, 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 doing, in doing it. Um, and you know, to this day, we've operated fairly, uh, fairly independently from, the, you know, from our parent company at, uh, at Logitech. Um, I guess the other thing that surprised me was how adversarial the, the, um, um, you know, the negotiation process was on the definitive agreement. And I think it was because um, no one from the Logitech side on the, from their management team was present during the negotiations. It was me and our, my CFO from LifeSize and our, 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 our team at D&E talking to the Wilson Sonsini lawyer from the, other, from the other side. And that's a fine law firm, but he had no, you know, there was no guidance from the other side on where to give and where, and where not to give. And, so he he just would just hold the line, and we were making no we were making no progress at all, and so that was a, uh, a bit of a surprise, a little you know it's a little disappointing at that point. We finally got it all worked out, but that was uh, that was a little a little dis a little disconcerting. So I think you know if you in those types of transactions, if you want to get something done, you need to have your attorneys there with you, but the business people ultimately need to make make the decision because all these all these things, every one of these. Millions of points of negotiation in the definitive agreement all comes down to, to some sense of business risk, and which, which really cannot be quantified in any, in any way. A, a lot of that is, is you know, instinct and judgment and experience and, and, and how, much, how much business risk you're willing to take on each one of those points. And, and that's why the business people need to be there to, to, you know, to, make, the final, to make the final call on those things. So um, if you just... If the attorneys are just talking amongst themselves, then it's, things are just going to—it's it's just not going to move forward nearly as, as as quickly and effectively. And you might not like the might not like the outcome. Um, I mean, I think one of the strange things about representing companies on the sell side is you—you you know, in, you know, use life size as an example. I mean, you know, you you work with a company for six years. I mean daily board meetings and then you do it go through a sale process and you're 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 basically living together you might, you might as well move, move in because you're on the phone all the day and you're in each other's offices and then the deal closes and they're just they're just gone <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right you know it's just like he's on the beach somewhere he's got he's cashed well, and there's just they're just gone there's like this like void of like well yeah right. you know what what's what's next um and it's 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 sort of it's weird and it's um you know, from a from the legal perspective, it shows why you why you have to keep the pipeline. I mean, you you want you want a you know a team of life sizes coming through where there's you know when when you sell and, it, and it's it's great to be it's great to be there. I think um, 
you know, being a little uh, funny but, but sort of serious, the, the biggest surprise I've had is how the banker's fees um, far exceed the lawyer's fees. <laughs> um, uh, bank, bankers are, are very, very important. I mean, they're, they're, they're bringing the buyers to the table. Um, but, um, you know, lawyers get a lot of flack over their legal fees, but they are, they are nothing. They are dropping the bucket compared to the banker fees. I didn't, I didn't appreciate that until I saw the, <laughs> my first funds flow state, statement. And, and a, little, a little plug for lawyers. Um, I mean, I, I would encourage you as entrepreneurs to get your legal team in very early. I mean, we, um, we do add a lot of value. We are the ones that are with you sort of fighting over the finish line over little points that, that at the end of the day decide whether, you know, the buyer has a chance to come back and take additional money out of your pocket and things like that. And I, um, um, I think there's a tendency, and I, I understand it, I mean, particularly emerging companies, very cost sensitive. There's a, there's a tendency, I think, to hold advisors that are charging you by the hour, maybe at bay. Um, and I'll, I'll bring you in sort of at the last minute. And I, I, w I would just encourage you, um, if, and I'm not saying call V&E, but I would encourage you to get your advisors in place early on. On a successful deal, the amount of your legal bill and accounting fees and all that stuff is going to be hopefully relatively small to the overall purchase price. But it's, it's certainly, from my perspective, worth your while to get, get your folks in there early. Having sold many companies, more than I can mention, um, I would say it's, um, it's a cost that very much gives you a return on investment. And I say that quite seriously, as I don't like to spend money either. But quite seriously, if you don't have the right people with you on your team, you're not going to get the right outcomes, right? I have Absolutely. to slightly change the subject. Okay. And given um, this is Veterans Day, or Armistice Day, as we would call it, um, Craig, tell me a little bit about coming from the Naval Academy and becoming an entrepreneur. You said, well, you didn't like you didn't really like the big organizations, but you keep building them big. Yeah, you know? well, you're, either, you're either growing or you're shrinking. <laughs> um, but for veterans who, yeah. you know, what advice so I, would you give them? I would say, them? and uh, my friend John Petricelli there in the, up in the, where is he? Where's John? Up there, in, uh, there's yeah. John. Okay. John's a West Point graduate. Um, so John and I have, uh, have met and spent some, some time together over the past, uh, the past year or so. So he'll, I'm sure he can relate um, very well to what I'm, what I'm gonna say. But, my time at the, and everybody's entrepreneurial journey is, is different. Everybody draws inspiration and, and, uh, and experience from different places in their, in their life. But for me, um, my time at, at the Naval Academy and my time in the US Navy as, a, as an officer, I was a, the deck officer on a destroyer, nuclear weapons officer, and anti-submarine warfare officer on a destroyer. San Diego made a deployment out to the, to the Indian Ocean, Persian Gulf. Um, many years ago, but um, those experiences shaped who I am as a, as a leader, as a manager, um, and are absolutely instrumental in, in my success um, today as a, as a business person uh, from the standpoint of um, accountability, responsibility, work ethic, discipline, um, integrity, taking care of your people, uh, just the, the, the basic leadership building blocks that you would use as a, uh, you know, a platoon commander in the Marine Corps or in the Army or a division officer in the Navy um, are abs were absolutely critical to, to my success. And I, and, uh, and I say that all the time. I'm very grateful to my, although I did not stay in as a career, um, I am very grateful to my, my time uh, in, the, in the Navy. Uh, not just for the opportunity to serve, uh, you know, the service to our to our country, but I mean the the life lessons that has has given me and continue to I, I continue to rely upon them um, every single day in the uh, in, in the office. I have to say it's very unusual to have a bio that where you talk about your team and members of your team being with you ten years in your bio. That actually speaks to the. The messages you just we actually had a company meeting this morning at uh, at Life Size, and I handed out uh, three more ten-year awards at Life Size for a company that's eleven years old. I was really, really proud <coughs> of uh, of that. That uh, and I've had a good fortune, a uh, number of, and some of those people, uh, two out of the three, had um, had worked with me even longer. Had come from my previous company over and worked with me at uh, at, at the, the previous startup as, as well. So it's just very. Very, uh, very gratifying. That was, speaks to those leadership skills. I'm going to open the floor to questions. So please, uh, if you would go to the microphone, if you have 
questions you'd like to ask either of our panelists. Um, while you guys think about that, I'm also going to ask Milam here, um, is selling a, quote, small business to a large company the same as any transaction of selling a business, a large to a large? No, uh, it's sort of um, counterintuitive. Uh, the bigger the deal volume and the more sophisticated the company is, the easier a transaction is. You know, you, you read these, um, you read these stories in the paper about you know a fifty billion dollar deal. Um, that's actually from a from a process standpoint a fairly easy deal to get done. Um, you know, when you're a twenty five billion dollar public company, the level of something being material to your business, I mean, that's a very high threshold. You know, at that level, what you're really concerned about is we want to get the deal done and we want to prevent um, our public shareholders from suing us. And that, that's, that's really, I mean, that's truly, that's, that's all the focus of about deal protection and protecting the board. You know, it's really the smaller the deal, the more difficult it is. Um, you know, when you're dealing with companies who are, you know, early stage, just from a resource allocation standpoint, and haven't had the, you know, the ability to, you know, have, and that's, you know, to cross all the T's and dot on the I's. I mean, your, your buyers are going to come over there, and as I mentioned, I mean, they're going to they're going to overturn every stone, and th those are those are really difficult um, and, and frankly costly. From a you know, comparing your your deal expense to deal value, those are those are a higher expense. Um, I mean, they're a lot more fun for the the lawyer. I mean, there's. Um, you know, I, I I like doing deals where they don't have in-house counsel because we get to we get to sort of act in that role. Um, you know, we've we've done a lot of work for Dell, for example, over the years, and I mean, representing Dell in an M and A deal is just a totally different ballgame. I mean, they've got hundreds and hundreds of in-house lawyers, just kind of like being on the Logitech side on the life size deal. Um, so it's I mean, they're they're more challenging just because your company is not going to be perfect. There the, there are those issues that we have to fix sort of at the eleventh hour, like. Hey, the person who wrote like our first code that's now in every product, yeah, we don't we don't really know we own that code. But that that comes up, um, you more know, often you, you more often than you think. <laughs> um, you know, our our customer, our, our number one customer, where eighty percent of our revenues, yeah, they can have the right to terminate this contract at any time. I mean, those those things come up in companies, and again, when you're when you're dealing with big public companies, there's just that's just sort of more background noise. You have these crazy emotional entrepreneurs who love their business yeah. like their children. <laughs> <laughs> don't want to let it yeah. go. <laughs> Do they really want to sell? They don't really want to sell. <laughs> no, it, it's, we, we, um, we just did a deal for um, a, a VC private equity firm in town. They, they, they made a significant investment in a company um, where in the services space where the, the founder, I mean, came to America you know, in the 90s with $500 in his pocket, I mean, built this company from nothing to this, you know, very successful company. And um, it was a couple days before closing and the deal sort of went quiet. And um, I mean, he was sort of having the moment, like I'm, I'm, I'm giving away control of my baby to these, you know, these venture capitalists, these, um, and I mean, Craig, you're right, I mean, it's, this is something that you've you've grown and you've built and you've you've put all your blood, sweat, and tears and I mean for a year sometimes years and decades you've this has been your day in and day out and you're sort of the idea of passing control over to someone else can be a very sort of emotional moment um, and we I mean th that this most recent deal was the most visible of that to me but I think I think it happens on, in most deals. Uh, I suspect you're right, Brett. Um. I've always, at least my understanding was that uh, selling a company to a strategic buyer may be easier than to, say, a financial buyer like a private equity firm because the incentives for the private equity firm may be uh, even more aggressive to pay less, uh, whereas a strategic buyer can argue for the synergies and things of that nature, but it sounds like Logitech, which I would characterize as a strategic buyer, uh, they have pretty sharp elbows as well. So. I think from, from both of your perspectives, how do you compare the two in your experience with both? I think uh, in, now that I've reflected on it, I understand where Logitech was coming from. They, they operate in a business where they're selling you know, mice and keyboards for $19.99 and selling them by the million. So a penny in cost matters to them a lot. <coughs> and so they are very, very tough negotiators on, on everything versus maybe a 
if Google bought our company or uh, you know Cisco bought our company, that is, that operates on very high gross margins and, and a much higher growth profile, and I think that's I think that's part of where that where that came from. Now, once we were part of Logitech. This is a this is a little, a little reminds me of a, of a joke we used to uh, we used to say that going through an acquisition is like um, getting divorced and then going on your honeymoon <laughs> <laughs> because you're going through that horrible contentious um, I've been divorced so I've, I've been through that <laughs> that negotiation as well and it's, it, it's you're going through that same contentious adversarial relationship for weeks where they're trying to extract as much money out of us as we can and, and, our, and our, uh, our, our shareholders, the venture capital group. And then the day you sign it, you know, you know they're your best buddy and your colleague and now you just have to go off and work together <laughs> for the next number of years and it takes some, it takes some, uh, it takes some time to, uh, you know, to, get, to get through that. So it's really, it's really an interesting process. It's, I can't think of a better analogy than, uh, than that, actually, of what that, what that feels like on both sides. Tell me how the people dynamics work for the staff. One day they're reporting to you, you're the CEO, and then the next day there's someone else there. For a CEO being purchased by a larger company where there's going to be some integration, and, and it, and it uh, Life size, I mean, Logitech, there was no you know, redundant people. We didn't have to lay anybody off. But, um, but for a, a CEO of a, of a smaller organization going into a big company, making sure that your people are taken care of uh, and so that they feel comfortable about going, going in there, that they have a home, that they, have a, they still have a career path is a, is a, uh, is a hard thing. Um, you know, uh, you, that, that takes a lot, of, a, a lot of time and a lot of discussion. And, and um, you know it's a it's a, a very difficult a very difficult thing to make sure that everybody can and some people you know ultimately are not going to have the same job. Our CFO was not going to be the CFO of Logitech. They already had a CFO, so then he becomes a divisional controller. Well, that's not really what he signed up for, and so then then you know then that starts to be a, that starts to be a, you know a, a problem that or a, you know. Uh, an issue that you need to that you need to deal with and, and try and find a solution for it. Did you have uh, key people signed up in the contract in the sale? I you had to keep certain people. Through yes. The other side? Yes, that was uh, there was a um, um, uh, certain number of of our key technical people and certain members of our executive staff had to sign an employment agreement with Logitech, and they were very generous on uh, you know uh, retention bonus and. Uh, and uh, and equity in Logitech and and uh, you know a, a signing bonus. And they were they were very generous in that way. But you needed to. But there were certain certain amount of us that had to sign up. And and then Vincent and, uh, Vincent Elkins couldn't couldn't represent me on that part of my transaction. Then I had to go find another lawyer to represent me and my in my employment agreement because B and E was representing our company in the sale. I was like, what? Why? <laughs> What's happening here? Um, and then each one of the, the key people, in the, in the, each one of the key people got their own lawyer, and so then we had all the, you know had all these law firms negotiating, uh, you know, with Logitech on their own, trying to keep these agreements 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 straight. Full, full employment for lawyers. Yeah. Yeah. It's very <laughs> it's very complicated. Yeah. Very complicated. Much more complicated than we think. Yeah. Questions from the audience, please. Greg, would you mind going to the microphone? Thank you. And I'm not sure how much you'd be able to share, but could you maybe tell us some of the ways you were keeping Logitech uh, honest during the transaction? Did you have, were you running sort of an auction process? Did you have a, a backup buyer? Were you playing two buyers off against each other? Yeah, that's, that side of things. Well, that's where the, that's where the banker can earn their money. And, and Mylon was, was joking about how much money the banker earns relative to the, the lawyer. The bankers take a percentage of the deal that's negotiated up front, and you know your your attorneys are paid hourly, generally. Um, and so, where your banker can can earn their fee is if you get a get an offer. There's a brief window of time, and some subtle ways that they can 
go explore interest with other strategic buyers. And in the very best situation, and this happens, it happens occasionally, um, is that you can get a bit of a, particularly in the tech world, you can get a bit of a bidding war going uh, for, your, uh, for your company that, for instance, uh, this happened many, many times where HP and Dell were bidding against each other for, you know, for companies in the storage space or in the, in something like something like that. So if you can get a, if you can get this auction going between two companies, that's the, um, that's the, you know, the very best thing for the, um, for the for the company in terms of raising the, the raising the valuation, particularly if it's two large strategic buyers that have, that have have deep pockets. Um, we actually walked away from the from the, the Logitech deal. Uh, we had agreed on a price, and um, about uh, two weeks before we were going to close the deal, after all the due diligence had done, the CEO of Logitech called and said, well, we changed our mind. It's not this price. It's, I forget actually what the number, what the number was. Um, it's, you know, we're giving you a 20% haircut. I said, okay, thanks, we're done. You know, and where's that effect? And we just and we we walked away, um, completely walked away. So that's it. Shut down the data. You know, the data room. We're we're uh, we're uh, we're folding up our tent and going home. And they came back of you know a couple of days later and renegotiated. And we didn't get everything that we wanted, but it it came up you know substantially from where we were from where we were before. So I think you have to. The point of that is you have to have conviction to walk away. You know, that's really the only leverage point that you, you have as a, as a small company. I think that's key. Other questions? Sir, if you go to the microphone. Hi. Um, could you guys both explain the uh, initiating the process for the buyout from the entrepreneur side and also from the lawyer side? More so in getting the uh, employees like the board and partners to reach a consensus or just an agreement? Yeah, I mean, so, uh, you know, most, most processes start with the board deciding um, that it's, it's time, you know, time to sell the company. And if you're, you know, typically startup, you know, emerging companies, particularly in the technology space, um, have venture, venture money, and you, you will have one or more venture representatives on your board. Um, and so, you know, at that point, you've already sort of done a sale to a, um, a financial buyer because you've taken VC money. And so, they're, you know, they're looking at how long have they been in, how much did they invest, you know, with the return on investment. And, you know, they're, you know, most, I think most VCs have sort of a three to five year window where they kind of want to get out of a company. And so, you know, it's particularly in the private in the private company side, I mean, those conversations typically start with the board. I mean, it, you will occasionally be in a situation where you're just running your company, and you know, letter of intent comes across and says, "Hey, we want to buy you," and that sort of starts the process. Um, you know, mo in most processes, employees are kept out of the dark until really the eleventh hour, and maybe it's after you sign. I mean, there'll you'll you'll need kind of a key group of folks. Um, to sort of help manage the process, but uh, you, you typically don't sort of get rank and file employees brought over the wall until, again, it, in, in most deals, there's a time period between the time you sign the deal and the close of the deal, and you wouldn't really sort of tell your employee base en masse until you have a definitive agreement, um, mainly because you're worried about it sort of getting out of the market, and as we all know, the more people you tell, the better chance that there is of, of a leak. Um, but you know, your, your board will be heavily involved in the process. Um, and really, once you decide to sell, I mean, it's, it's your board acting as the board to go through that. And um, you know, your, your CEO may be sort of interfacing, but ultimately it's the board and your controlling stockholders' decision, is this a deal we're willing to do or not? Yeah, in our case, I think our most entrepreneur, entrepreneurs who go, go in and raise a significant amount of venture capital money in a in a high growth space. Um, your mindset is generally when we're going to go build this, you know, and as I think you you need to start off with the mindset we're going to build a, a market leading standalone company that has the opportunity to to uh, you know to have an IPO. And if if a buyer comes along uh, along the way and offers us a compelling alternative. Then, then that's okay. Then that's okay too. I think if you if you 
uh, have the mindset I'm going to build a company and then I'm going to sell it, I think you'll probably not do the right things from a, a, a strategy standpoint in building in terms of building in terms of building the team. There's a, an old ad, old adage that at least in the tech business that the best businesses are bought, they're not sold. Um, you can't really just go put a for sale sign on your front yard and wait for people to to come take a look. It doesn't, at least in the in the tech world, it really it doesn't work that way for the very best companies. Now that does happen, but you're not going to get any kind of a premium valuation that you would that you would want, or at least that that you had envisioned from the from the start. So, um, in most companies, are if they have the are in, you know the, the technology and the growth pro profile, are on a path. At least they're thinking we're going to do an IPO, and often during that process along the way, a strategic buyer will come or multiple at various stages, and this happened with, with LifeSize as well, come sniffing around and, and, and see what, if, if you, can, uh, you can strike a, you know, strike a deal with them. But um, as a CEO, I get inquiries from bankers all the time. Hey, we've got this company. Would you like to take a look at it? Would you like to, to like, we're trying to sell this company. Would you want to take a look at it? And 100% of the time, it's, um, you know, a very small company that, that's really not growing. It's a damaged asset in some in some way. Um, you know, it's it's a it's a company that maybe never really hit its stride. Uh, and then, but those are those calls, those companies are kind of are sold at significant significant discounts. Absolutely, sir. Mr. Malo, I have a question about the innovative process you went through when uh, formulating. Uh, life size. Uh -huh. You said that there was a new wave of technology that enabled oh. communication in a better way. Yes. Uh, my, my question is, how did you find out about this new technology? And was it something that you casually came across, or were you looking with the intent to bring a new uh, product to market? Well, this really happened um, th three times in my, in my career, just in the video communication business. That in, in every technology business, every few years, there's a a, you know, a, a new wave, a, a, a next generation, a leapfrog technology, a leapfrog pro, a pro, product that, uh, that, that's coming along, you know, a new advanced technology. And I think really the only way to recognize that is to immerse yourself in that, you know, in that, in that industry, in that, in that business, um, either on the, the development side or the, or the product side where you're, you're kind of working in that innovative, innovative process. If for, and for the, the video communication business, the, the first innovation that we took advantage of in 1996, when I started my first company, was uh, you know low-cost set-top boxes with graphical user interfaces using a you know a new a new type of video algorithm that uh, you know performed as well and was one-fifth the cost as the current systems because there was some you know new a new new way of technology. And so that was a big leapfrog, big innovation in the market, and we grew the we grew the company. The the next at, at life size, the big innovation was High definition over the you know over public IP net over public IP networks that hadn't been done before. Existing players are often reluctant to adopt that you know the cutting edge cutting edge te technology either for either for development risk or to cannibalize what they you know can cannibalize their, their recurring revenue stream. Um, and the current uh, you know disruptive technology um, yeah, that's good. And if often in technology business, if you miss that cycle. The, the leaders in that one phase of the business are often, in that one phase of the technology cycle, are not often the leaders in the next phase of the technology cycle. And history is full of examples in the tech business of, you know, a new way, a new way of doing things comes along, and, and a, a previous market leader is just is just is just shoved aside. Um, and the new one, the new, uh, you know, the, the new technology revolution transformation that's going on in the video communication business is about. Cloud service and you know and, and mobile devices and if LifeSize had continued on, um, you know our current path of making expensive conference room hardware only and more expensive on-premise infrastructure for companies' data centers, we'd be dead, absolutely dead. And uh, it's one of the, the challenging things and, and 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 interesting things about about video. But you just have to is this clever balance and you know the the master at this uh, probably of all time is. Uh, you know, maybe Henry Ford and certainly Steve Jobs was to understand 
the intersection of what is technically possible and what do people and what do people want, and 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 and, and delivering that to the market at the absolute absolute right time. And I think in a in our, our in a very small way, you know, we tried to do that at uh, at you know along my along our career at the life size in the video communication in the video communication business. But that's a it's a really um, is there's an art to that as well as a science of, of finding the right product at the right time to get that to get that product market market fit. But if you can do it, then it you know then then you've got a a, 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 a good a good path. Uh, I think tonight that's an excellent stage to leave the conversation. So those of you out there should be looking for that intersection of the technology path and what the customers want. And when you have that, you have a company. I'd like you to join me in thanking our guest tonight, Craig Malloy, Milam uh, Newby. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd further like to thank our representative from Locke, uh, Lord, who's here, who is uh, with uh, Merrill Lynch and Bank of America hosting our reception tonight. So please join us outside, and if you have any questions for our guests, please come up directly. Thank you.